Our gospel for this Sunday comes to us from the fifth chapter of the gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now in this, uh, you see the chairs behind me. It is, you know, we're going to do one of our Life of Faith interviews again today. And one of the things we do is we ask if there are lessons that are, want to be picked. This lesson was picked by the one we will be doing the interview with. The first lesson was I picked because I thought it went well with what was going on. Um, in the first one we did, Kim picked the first lesson and I picked a gospel to go with it. But this is you're right in the middle of when Jesus is going back and forth and a lot of things are going on. And it's amazing the power of touch, in this case to him. So Jesus went with them. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, O Christ. Please be seated. Now, I was told that I forgot to tell an engineering joke, you know, you know, for when Kim came up, and, you know, Pete's of a different, you know, uh, vocation. Um, he, he's, he's an instructor, he's a teacher, and I tried to, to uh, study up for this kind of test, but I failed. No? Okay. Um, for our life of faith, it's about, you know, how are we, when we live our life of faith, out in the world? What does it mean when we go out there? And how might that look? And so today I would like to uh, invite up Pete Peterson, who is an instructor at Tucson High, uh, Tucson High School in digital communication and graphic designs. And once upon, not that long ago, it was graphic design and digital communications. It shows how fast the field is changing. Let me grab my, my binder. But Pete, come on up. Yeah. Breathe. This is the second one. This should be easier, right? Second period is always easier. Sometimes second period is the first one of the day. <laughs> okay, that's true. Okay, that's fine. <coughs> okay, Excuse Pete, me. Um, I know you and your family have been here for a while, but one of the things we found out from the first interview is even people who have been around for a while may not know you as well as they think they know you. Would you like to introduce yourself a little bit more? Okay. No, I'm all done. <laughs> no, actually, I'm Pete Peterson. Uh, Dorothy and I and my family have been here since 1998, April of 1998. Uh, we got here because of the military. I was active duty Air Force, and they decided to send me here after I had been traveling all over the world. Uh, I had been a graphic designer and a printer for 21 years and got here running the shop out at the base. and. Got ready to retire, and it was either we go to Florida, where Dorothy's from, and or go to California. And I couldn't afford to move to California, so we stayed right here. <laughs> <laughs> and we've been here ever since. Uh, Family, what do you have? I have four kids, ranging from 40 to 23. Uh... Two of the kids live here in Tucson. Uh, I've got Dorothy, of course. <laughs> and That's good. and uh, I've got five grandkids. I know I don't look like I should have grandkids, but... <coughs> Excuse 
excuse me. I've got an eight-year-old, and the young, that's the oldest. I've got a five-year-old uh, one, that's going to be six. Oh, my goodness. I've got a two-year-old that's going to be three. I've got... That's what uh, happens. Yeah, I've got a, mu a year and a half, and she's got me wrapped around my little, her little finger. And then I've got a, one that's going to be five months old. So they've been keeping me from church recently over the last couple of years. It, little ones have a tendency to have demands on time and energy. Yes. Yeah. So, so what is your, I mean, what's your day, a day in the life of Pete like? As you head out like into, and head out into the world and you head out to work, what's that day? Well, what's prep that day starts like? at about 5.30 in the morning. I wake up, make the coffee, go get cleaned up, ready for the day, uh, go out, sometimes I make my lunch, other times I just make the coffee, and then depending on where Dorothy's at, whether she's still sleeping from working at Target like she does on Friday and Saturday, I give her a kiss, goodbye. Other days when she's rushing out to go pick up the kids, I'll catch her, <laughs> see ya. Sometimes it's an air kiss. <laughs> but then it's get in the truck and drive down to Tucson High. Uh, and try to get there into my own parking spot, or my regular parking spot, which gives me some Fitbit steps. <sighs> so what do you do when you're heading out from, you know, as, you're, as you, you, got, you got your parking spot and as you're walking in, What's your routine then? Well, before I even get out of the truck, I usually sit there and say a prayer. I mean, I'll go through the Lord's Prayer, but I got two other prayers, the confession of faith, and then there's the one of thanksgiving. And I go through giving thanks for my family, uh, on both sides, mm -hmm. mine and Dorothy's, mm -hmm. I, I, I automatically, I mean, not automatically, I always give thanks for this congregation and pray for blessings on this congregation. Uh, but I end the prayer with giving thanks and blessing on the two schools that I've taught at within TUSD mm -hmm. uh, and their families because I know that they need them. So, so how did, so how does the, you know, when, once you get in that prayer, in that space, then you go and face the day. How does that go? In general. In general, I don't know what I'm facing before I walk in or actually before the students walk in. Uh, it could be a regular day of doing nothing but lessons. Uh, but nine times out of 10, it never pounds out that way. I, I always claim that I don't do a good job of teaching by the standards, because uh, something's gonna come up. Uh, that changes everything. Uh, some days I could be prepping a dad joke, like uh, where do graphic designers live? They live in Adobe's because we teach Adobe in my classroom, Adobe software, so used to be song of the day, but now it's dad jokes, but we changed it to dog jokes because my lead editor for yearbook, she said we need to change it to dog jokes, not dad jokes. But it, I mean, it could start off great or like on Friday morning. The lead editor, her, she's been with me since she was a freshman, and she's a senior now. 
And she'd always come up to me at the end of class and go like this, see you later, dog. And I'd say it back, see you later, dog. So she's got the nickname of dog. Uh, but I use a system on the cell phones that they can text me and let me know what they need for homework, what, where they're going to be during the day. Well, Friday, dog texted me. And uh, she said, Pete, I'm sorry. I can't make it to class today. And the next part of the sentence was, my grandpa passed away. Now, I knew that something like this was possible because two weeks ago, uh, he went into the hospital. On Monday, she came and texted me again and said that she wasn't going to make it because her, her granddad was being put in hospice. And uh, he had to have his gallbladder removed. And things kind of got better. And then suddenly on Monday, she said he was going into hospice. Um, and I didn't know, I mean, she came to school the rest of the week, but the only thing I could tell her in the text message, because she wasn't there, was, you know, saying my prayers are with you or my condolences. I told her, those are hollow words. They're just words that people kind of say, in my opinion. And I go, they don't know what we're going through in those situations. Uh, the pain that we're feeling, the missing. And I told her, you need to cry. You need to, you need to have that feeling. But someday, someday when you're ready, you need to start sharing those memories, those times that you got to spend with your granddad. And she typed thank you, and then a second later, she typed another message to me, and she goes, Pete, I told my grandpa that you were my second pop-pop. Now, my grandkids gave me this pen, and it's got pop-pop on it. But some of my students are calling me pop-pop now. And she goes, she continued on, she goes, I've told my grandpa about you and how you were my second pop-pop, and he was looking so forward to meeting you at graduation. She's a senior this year. Uh, two weeks ago, I got an email from two girls that uh, they're both in my yearbook class. One's a senior, one's a junior. Uh, they texted or they emailed all their teachers and said that their mom had passed away on Saturday. This was on Monday. And it's like, what do I do? Well, the next day I got, I had planning period and I went around to the school and I was talking to teachers of these two girls saying, hey, I've been in contact with them. I'm, I'm trying to help them out. And uh, it's like, the mom had gotten diagnosed with cancer in spring last year, so it was a very quick cancer. But on Tuesday, I went to the counseling department, and one of the counselors in there that had been helping the girls too said, oh, they're already back on campus today. And it's like, how? How are they here? I get back up to my room, and they're ditching class, but they're there waiting for me. And it's like, why? Why are you here at school? 
The only thing I could think of is that they needed to be there. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, if nothing else, your classroom was a, a safe space for them to be in when everything else was going crazy in their world. Yeah. I mean, it ended up, they came in, and I gave them the same kind of speech that I gave Dog, and I've got a tradition with most of my students. It's either a knuckle bump or it's one of these. Pinky swear. It's a pinky swear. They know that I'm there for them. Mm -hmm. I, again, I, I don't teach by the lesson plan that I have written up every day because it changes. 22 years, you would think that I could teach to a lesson plan just to meet the standard, but every day there's a different situation. Now, as I say, students don't remember the lesson. They remember how the teacher made them feel. Yeah, there's, there's two situations. In my first year around Veterans Day, I had a girl come in. Now, Veterans Day is in November. She came in on the Friday, and most of us know that you don't wear a heavy coat. You don't wear gloves in November. That's later in December and January. But she was sitting diagonal from me over here, and I asked her how she was doing. Mm -hmm. And she said she tried to commit suicide. Stopped what I was doing, and I went and sat across from her, and I said, what, what, wait a minute, what's going on? She, long story, got to the point where I was outside the room with her, and she told me, finally told me that her stepdad had molested her. She wanted to go to class, but I had already had my students working on their assignment. So at the end of the conversation, I walked her to class. I got back to my room, and I picked up my phone, and I called CPS and told them that I had a student that almost committed suicide. They said, well, it's going to be 72 hours before we can get out there. And I, I said some few choice words can't say I'm up here <laughs> and then I got a hold of the nurse on campus they got the police department out and got a contract with her uh, and they got the stepdad arrested but she left school came back and graduated she was a sophomore that year she graduated with her class three years after she graduated she came back to the school knocking on my door right before the school year started and I had kind of put the knock off the doors open did that twice finally the third time I got up went to the door and it was her and I was surprised to see her she goes come on out to the parking lot I got something to show you and I walked out and there's this big black Escalade parked it's not in a parking spot it's in the middle of the drive and I go, you got me an Escalade. <laughs> she slapped my arm, kind of hurt. She opened up the back door on the driver's side, and there's this car seat with a little baby in it. And she said, you're an honorary grandpa. I haven't seen that little girl since then, but I know that she's in a good place. Her mom works at a special care place for women mm -hmm. and children. And that little girl is now a sophomore in high school. Another time I had a kid, a young man come to my door, same time a year, several years later, didn't let him get to the third knock. On the second knock, I got up, walked to the door, and it shocked me. I yeah, this, he was, student, this student was one that wasn't one of your he wasn't. Students. He wasn't one of my better students. He didn't, hadn't graduated, but it was after his graduation time. 
He didn't do any of my projects. Uh, I had just gone through gangland task force training when he was in my class, and I knew he was a gang member. His Vato shirt was all the way buttoned up, all that. Didn't do a thing. But he came to me that day, and he said, Mr. Peterson, you probably don't remember me. And I go, I don't remember your name, but I remember where you sat. And I know that you didn't do my lessons and you didn't graduate. And he said, I want to thank you, though. And I go, for what? I failed you in the lessons. And he said, no, no, you didn't fail me. I've jumped out of the gang. I'm safe from the gang. But I listen to your dad's stories every day. And I've gotten my GED. Now, I sit there and I look at those two kids in the 3,000 some odd kids that I've taught over the year and I look back at my own kids and I look at them and hear them say that I didn't do that good of a job. I failed them. But I look and I try, tried to do for them what I did for my own students. And I think my kids are pretty good at home. They still have faith. They may not come to church, but they still have faith. These kids, I can't talk to them about religion, but I think what I've done by being there for them at least helps. Well, obviously, you know, yes, in the public school system, you know, proselytizing, speaking of religion, is complicated, if not absolutely forbidden in certain ways. But um, obviously, in many ways, you let that light so shine before them. You gave them something. I it hope. may have been your presence. It may have been something as simple as this. Knowing that you're there and you will fulfill that. There are many ways in which we live out our faith. It doesn't necessarily mean talking about it. it sometimes we think of faith as unspoken, you know, silent. No, it could just be unspoken. But it's supposed to be lived. And you showed that to them. I hope so. That is what we all seek to do in how we use the space in front of us. We love our neighbor and our students and our own children as ourselves. And again, it may not be the fact that the lesson that you taught them might have very little to do with graphic design, but more importantly, you taught them about maybe hope and life and new life. Thank you, Pete. Thank you.